Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today we're talking with Casey Sampson from Sampson Historical. Casey and I met up at the Kalamazoo Living History Show this year for the first time since uh, really 2020 when we got to thinking about it and talking about it. And, uh, and we wanted to kind of talk a little bit about what the last two years has been like for Casey and the entire company of Sampson Historical and how they pivoted how they changed, how they got stronger to get through the pandemic, to make it through the pandemic and all the business challenges that came along with that and how that has shaped their business going forward. I think there's a lot of interesting perspectives here that the Samsons had to endure and get through. And I think it can be very inspiring for anybody out there that has a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit or just wants to learn a little bit more about kind of the business side of the muzzleloading and living history community. The Sampsons are one of those families, one of those businesses that's been around for generations supplying muzzleloading and living history equipment and gear to the community as a whole. And I think it's good to check in with them and hear from them and get some of their perspectives about how things are going and how things have been, especially after kind of a business historic event like the past two years have been. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Casey, again, thank you for coming on. Well, I appreciate it. The last time we were on, I think uh, was right. Uh, maybe right before COVID uh, really started going. So it's uh, it's kind of unique. We get to speak right before COVID and, and now right after uh, we're trying to get back to normal. Yeah, I think we talked at the Connor Long Rifles show, and I remember at that show, people were talking about the first cases of it being in the United States, and we weren't sure how that was going to affect the rest of the year, because that was one of the first events that we have here in the Midwest. Yeah, that's that's true. And uh, I remember we were we were looking at uh, some proofs from a, we just did our very first uh, full scale photo shoot, multi day long, and we were looking at uh, kind of the proofs in the catalog and talking about uh, what we are, are planning on doing for that year. And uh, you know, I, like every plan, uh, it's, it's always humorous to look at after the fact uh, because it was just a few short days after that. That we realized that this was going to be different. Um, so, you know, I, I guess to kind of maybe get us started, I remember the time and the place we were at when we found out that uh, the Kalamazoo Living History Show, largest uh, show in the Midwest and certainly our largest indoor show, uh, was canceled. And um, boy, was that a that was a blow. Um, like so many vendors, we we, de- we kind of depend on on certain shows to move us from from each quarter and Kalamazoo is one of those shows and um, as I had kind of mentioned we were processing our, our catalog and it was our first large uh, catalog that had, wasn't stapled together you know it was, it was a nice professional catalog and we had sunk a lot of money into that uh, knowing that we were going to be it Kalamazoo, Fort Fred, and all these different shows, and uh, yeah, that was that was yanked away from us pretty quickly. So that's that show runs in March. When you guys are looking at producing and this printing this catalog, which you have every year since, and I've I've got my copy here. It's I love looking at it, and you, you change the art direction each time, which I think is really cool. But how long before that point did you start that production planning on the twenty? 20- 20 year i think it was or was it 2019 so no it's it, yeah it was a 2020 catalog um and we actually start each year um after our last event of the season which is typically uh at camden south carolina which is the first second weekend of november so after we get that we have our cyber monday sale that we do every year and then we get right into the catalog and um that's everything from sourcing new product to research and development, uh, pr- production, actually making the product that we're selling. Uh, lots of different uh, people involved in that. And then in January of each year is when we actually have our photo shoot. Uh, February, we lay out the catalog. March, we print the catalog. And the middle of March, we start handing it out. It comes out every year. So really our, our year, we consider our year starting really at the Kalamazoo Living History Show. That's the start of our year, and um, so we were we we had everything printed, ready to go. In fact, uh, when the when the cancellation came for for Kalamazoo the day prior, 
I went to the terminal in Indianapolis, uh, UPS terminal, to pick up the two pallets oh, of geez. our catalogs just the day before. Hmm. So. so what was going through your mind then when the kind of the show of the quarter, as you put it, was canceled? I mean, was that the first cancellation for you guys that year? I believe it was. Um, yeah, it, it was. It was the first one. Uh, I had a friend uh, that, that had a business uh, and, and a fabric business, and she called me. And it was right around the same time. It was a, an SCA, a Society of Creative and Mechanism, uh, an SCA event. I believe down in, it was in the South Georgia, somewhere on there, and they canceled uh, that event. She called. She was. I, I think this is real. I think this is going to really hurt us. I thought, man, this is this is not good. You know, we're, when, when vendors all start saying the same thing of not having a good feeling, right? That usually means something's not right. And uh, then that when Kalamazoo canceled, it it uh, was a scare, obviously really scary. Uh, then shortly thereafter, we started hearing some kind of scuttlebutt that um, Fort Fred may cancel, and we thought, oh no, well, if this happens, we're we're done for. And, uh, well, sadly it did happen. Um, uh, and, you know, I had to do something that I'd never done before in my entire life. And, uh, that was to ask the people that had supported us by purchasing and, and by being and sharing our, our content and just being supporters of our, of our brand. I had to literally ask them for financial assistance. We started to go fund me, um, because we put everything we had into our catalogs, new products. We just launched, um, we were one of the fewer vendors that carry um, kid shoes, mm -hmm. actually at leather kid shoes uh, from infant sizes all the way up to like 10 year old. That's good to and know. And we, we did the entire line of those. Um, we, we invested money in a lot of different products and a lot of different advertising. And everything stopped. Sales stopped. People stopped going to the website. Everything stopped. Uh, all the canceled. All the shows were canceling. We went from a full staff to going down to a skeleton crew because we didn't know about the virus. We were trying to figure out, you know, what was safe, what was not, mm -hmm. and then we, we we went down to two days a week, um, and it, it was such an odd time. And scary, and you know, I do want to just take a quick moment to, to thank anybody that's listening who did contribute. Um, you know, I'll, I'll never truly be able to repay that debt. And uh, Abby and I are very humble and thankful for that opportunity uh, and that assistance because it truly is what helped us push over uh, until we could start getting some sales on the website again. And uh, it kept our employees paid. Abby and I didn't take that money uh, for ourselves. We kept our employees paid and the, and the lights on. Yeah. Um, and, and that was the most important thing to us. That kept you going long enough for you guys to, to think about what you needed to do to compensate for, for not having those events. Because those events, are, are they a large part? Are they a majority part of the business, at least at that time? At that time, uh, between Kalamazoo uh, and Fort Fred, and that was that was the oh I, I mean it was a significant amount mm -hmm. of our yearly sales um, or quarterly sales at least. Uh, so I mean it, it was it was detrimental not to have that that those two those two shows in particular. Um, not I mean and we lost every other show pretty much for that year. So there was a lot uh, that hurt. But yeah, it was. We, we did. We had to be crafty. We had to think outside of the box and outside of the normal that we've done for years prior and think how we can uh, kind of mold into this new normal. Where did you guys go then? I mean, you, you've got the lights on. You know that events aren't going to be happening. You know, did you kind of get back into the... You know the scrappy startup mentality where you're trying to figure out what's new and try a bunch of different things or did you did you start researching or, or where did you go from there we did a little bit of uh, everything um we sat around for a while uh, for the first couple of days and 
So I'm like, this is kind of nice. It's quiet and peaceful. Right. And then uh, <laughs> after about 48 hours, um, we said, okay, this is terrifying. What do we do? Uh, and I remember late, late March, early April, um, I was sitting at my desk in the middle of the night looking at our website and just kind of scrolling through and just kind of just, what am I doing here? What are we doing? I'm thinking, you know, I could do this better. We need to add, we need to do this. We need to add certain things. And so we, Abby and I kind of met after that the next day. And I said, we need to focus on our website. We need to focus on our social media. We need to spend this time. We know how to do it. Uh, Abby has a marketing background. I have always enjoyed technology uh, and, and utilizing technology to the best of our abilities. Uh, and I said, this is where we can spend our own time. We're not, we don't have to pay ourselves an hourly wage. So we're not paying anybody to do it. We can do it. We, we have the time to do it now. So that's what we've done. Uh, that's what we did. We, we sat down and started working on the website and we started, you know, really amping up our content that was actually on the, on the individual pages, the different, uh, the copy, the loading. Uh, we did the technology side of it. We upgraded certain things. Uh, we just really revamped it. <clears throat> and then there was a person one time that, that told me kind of a wise words of, you know, if, if you can afford it, or if you can afford to advertise, you should. If you can't afford to advertise, you must. <laughs> and, and, and that is, that, that stuck with me because we were like, well, we really need to get our name out there. Uh, there's people on the website all the time. We looked at our statistics and showed that, uh, you know, we're getting new customers. That to, for a few months, it was very small, but we was like, we're still, we're getting in new customers. So that tells me that we haven't reached everybody. And um, I learned pretty quickly, you will never, never reach everybody. Right. To this day, we're still getting, you know, brand new customers to the website. And so we started marketing uh, via social media and Facebook, um, Google, just different places, and, and spent the time and the money to do it. Um, we we just really sunk everything we could into advertising. And looking back, it was the smartest thing we ever did with our company was spend money to advertise. Because once that ball started, once that snowball started going down the mountain, it, it has not stopped. You know, we can, you know, you can just continue feeding the machine, so mm -hmm. to speak. And um, it, the biggest thing I said, the biggest thing we did was improve our website, which sounds simple, but it, it was far from simple. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, it's a lot of work into it. I mean, just photos alone take a long time. Uh, all the content, navigation, all of it. Uh, the, the SEO implements of it, search engine optimization. There's so many keys into the website. So much like you were optimizing your, your schedule during the event season and, and optimizing your, I imagine, your location on events and your setup at events, you know, took that same mentality then to your website, tried to optimize that for everybody that's coming around and coming by that might be interested in the kind of things that you guys produce and that you sell. So they would come in and, and start patroning your business too. Oh, precisely. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, because we had all those catalogs, uh, like I had mentioned, we, we printed, I don't know, maybe close to 15,000 catalogs. Uh, and we had nowhere to do with them. <laughs> right. <laughs> what do you we do had with no them? One to get into. And so I came up with this idea, said, let's get on Facebook. We'll create an ad that targets certain people. And we'll say, we're going to give you a free catalog if you just sign up for our, our, our minutes. And overnight, I remember having like four or 500. And then quickly, it was hundreds of people every day awesome. requesting a catalog. And that went on for a couple months. Well, everyone was at home. Right. So what's the best time to you and the best form of media was social media because that's what people were doing. We were all sitting at home looking at Facebook in between our, you know, Zoom meetings that we had to do. Yeah. And, you know, it was it was you had a lot of time online in front of a screen, in front of a device. And we capitalized that. And then I think because we were going to mail them something, 
a physical hard copy catalog, it was something they could they could look forward to and that they could look at and yeah. thumb through. And we mailed those catalogs out. Uh, we have our own mailing permit and we sorted them all and, and um, you know, individual bundles and put those bundles into sacks and took those sacks over to the post office. It's kind of a fun task. And I remember when they came time to pay for the postage, even with our permit, which we get a significant discount with, I remember looking at that and thinking, this could honestly be the nail on our coffin. <laughs> or this could be the cornerstone to a whole new world. Wow. Uh, and I'm happy to say it was a cornerstone, yeah. not the nail, uh, because about two weeks later, we started getting phone calls. Uh, and about three weeks, three to four weeks later, uh, we had our staff back full time. Wow. And so it went from website to marketing to the catalog that we had already planned on doing. And so really, um, I, I was blessed to have the time with COVID. I, because of COVID, we were blessed to have some time to really fix our website. Mm -hmm. So when people got that uh, catalog in the mail, they, they, could, they could see exactly what the catalog looked like. The same thing was on the website. Yeah, uh, the product, the description, everything that was that we spent all of those months working on, we just transferred that over to the website, and uh, it, it helped tremendously. Yeah, that website serves as the foundation. I think if you had ran this, I guess getting a little technical on it, but if you had ran that Facebook ad and had not done the website updates, I think you could have seen a very different result. Because that website for people, and this is, you know, applicable to a, a club or another business out there in this same field. If that website isn't up to snuff, that's kind of people's uh, validation check for something that they're looking at. And when that website is right and it's up to date and it's ready to go, people are going to trust you and people are going to want to work with you like you saw. And that's just wonderful. No, I absolutely. I couldn't agree more. The We had ran a different Facebook and social media advertising in the past. Um, and, and we did not see the same reactions and return of investment that mm -hmm. we did until after we optimized our website to the best of our, our abilities at the time. Hmm. So yeah, it, it was it was critically important to do it. Um, and it, I will be honest, you know, I some of it was pure luck uh, because we were we were stressed to the math, and yeah. I didn't know. No one had been in this situation before, so we didn't know how long this was going to be or what to do. And uh, it started with, I have nothing else to do. <laughs> I might as well try to do something. Right. You know, and the website was one of those things that always was on the back burner because we had physical things that had to be done. We had to go to an event. We had to make this product. We had to, you know, go somewhere, do something. And and when all that was taken away from us, we we had to sit at home. Well, I don't sit idle. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, vacations get stressful for me after four days because I'm like, I've got to get back to work. <laughs> and, and and so I I mean I truly love working for our business and um maybe me more than her. Uh, she likes the vacation, but I, I, <laughs> I, I, uh, I enjoy the time you spend. But I enjoy making our business more successful, and I enjoy having a business that supplies and allows our, our employees uh, to, to live a comfortable life. And yeah. That was probably the hardest thing for us is when we had to tell our employees that they had to uh, kind of step back. You know, we, we weren't firing them, but we were reducing their hours. And, Whew, man, if I never have to do that again, I will be forever thankful because that was, quite honestly, one of the hardest things I had to do was to, was to tell my staff that, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to fire you, but I can't pay you. Right, <laughs> you know? yeah, you're and kind of I, in a bind there. Yeah. And uh, thankfully, it all, it all paid out. And, and truthfully, we, we grew uh, more in the last 24 months than, than we have at any other time in our business. That's wonderful. Uh, so it's, it's being able to put all those things into place uh, that, that allow it that to happen. 
This podcast is brought to you by Thor Bullets. Thor Bullets are a premium full-bore muzzleloader bullet designed specifically for modern inline rifles. Thor Bullets do not require plastic sabos or belts to be fired, meaning less cleaning for you between shots. The patented copper base creates an airtight seal, giving you greater distance and accuracy. Thor's unique engineering allows the bullets to retain 95% of their weight upon impact, and the controlled expansion ensures large, easy-to-follow blood trails. Thor bullets are currently available in a 50 caliber version that is sized to your specific bore. Thor is also expanding into a new 45 caliber bullet designed for faster 1-in-24 and 1-in-22 twist inline rifles. For more information on these great bullets, visit www.thorbullets.com. We'd like to thank Thor Bullets for their sponsorship of this podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Muzzleloader Magazine, the publication for traditional black powder shooters. Since 1974, Muzzleloader has been the leading magazine devoted to traditional black powder hunting and shooting. Each issue is jam-packed with articles on hunting, shooting, gunsmithing, do-it-yourself projects, living history, American history, book and product reviews, and much, much more. Muzzleloader Magazine is the best traditional muzzleloading magazine, bar none. I'd like to thank Jason at Muzzleloader Magazine for his continued support of I Love Muzzleloading and the I Love Muzzleloading podcast. I don't care what you're into. If you're interested in muzzleloading, this is the kind of magazine I think you need to check out. I've been a fan of Muzzleloader Magazine even before the sponsorship. Uh, I've always been impressed with what Jason has been able to put out with Muzzleloader Magazine, and it really means a lot for him uh, to be supporting I Love Muzzleloading and our efforts over here. Thank you, Muzzleloader Magazine, for your support. So being, I mean, you guys supply accurate reproductions and, and living history equipment and and f- clothing and all sorts of things if, if you do if you haven't seen the samson website you really need to check it out and order something because they they make some great stuff was when we get into the kind of the later effects of this where supplies and logistics became an issue because i'm going to call it just in a broad sense living history is a rather small industry compared to most other things out there did you find it especially difficult to find the the equipment and supplies and, and the merchandise that you guys need to make your items and, and the items that you sell? Or was the, were the items that you sell able to kind of fly under the radar because they weren't necessarily needed by other industries, if that makes sense? There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. So <laughs> um, first, we did, we did experience, uh, and we are still experiencing uh COVID-related delays and uh, supply issues. Um, but they, they they came in waves, and right. they came with different severities on different areas of the world. So, um, you know, we, we work with now over 50 different uh, artisans and companies, and, and we work with people all over the world. And uh, we're, we're really proud to offer a, a very diverse group of of the product and to be honest i think because the entire world truly had a, a couple months pause um we didn't really see the effect for a while because when we went back to work everybody else went back to work and so it was almost like everything kind of paused but then we realized well because they were paused they couldn't make this now they're out of it and it takes a long time to make that whatever that might be mm-hmm. um you know wood for example we all know about the wood and the, the that market um and but uh, just anything and everything was protected we really didn't start seeing the uh supply chain issues until late 2020 early 21 um and that's when we started seeing that and what for us, what was initially impacted wasn't the supply of the goods; it was supply of the transportation, okay, ports, right, uh, airplanes, uh, trains, you know, pallets. Yeah, we we would have what even for our our um, magazine, you know, our catalogs, our print media, what was a one day turn to truck it from Ohio, you know, where our printer is in Ohio, to just north of Indianapolis, which we are. We're 30 minutes from downtown Indianapolis. We, we are not far or remote in the state. Uh, it was turning into a week or two week long trip because they were short on truck drivers and they were short on trucks or they were short on fuel. And uh, mostly it was the supply of the, of the 
workers. And so that was what really what we noticed was first. And then there was the raw materials. So on the leather side of the business, which um, we, we still do a lot of leather reproductions, but then we, we also make a lot of modern leather product. We couldn't get leather because the tanneries, because of the production stopping, uh, they had a lot of waste that they couldn't use, and then they had to re-up re their supply. Um, and then there were other, particularly uh, in, in larger industries, leather, they continued producing uh, because of, it was a needed product where we did not. And so they ate up all of the supply. And then when we had the demand for the leather, the tanneries didn't have the supply. Um, so... Uh, there was a there was a short term in, in, in between that two years. There was a short time where leather, in particular, the hides weren't being processed. They were just being thrown away because there was no one to process them. And so we were still processing meat, but we were not processing the hides because it was it was a byproduct. It wasn't the product that was as in demand at the time, and then the facilities didn't do it. Now that's not true of the world, but. In particular, the one tannery we do a lot of work with, that's what happened. So I guess I'm just using this as a couple of different examples. I mean, we, we were getting hit from every side. Um, and there are certain parts that go into our leather products, such as uh, the rivets. Those are all made in China um, in mass quantities and by the millions of days, but they were all shut down. And so when we ran out of rivets, it wasn't like normal where we go to our supply house in India and pick up a bag of rivets. He said, well, we don't have it because our distributor doesn't have it. Our distributor doesn't have it because they don't have it because it's sitting in a port somewhere. And so it, it was this major domino effect, little by little. Um, and, it, and it was weird because our companies are diverse. We have a lot of different avenues. Uh, not one thing hurt us hard, you know, in a very negative way, but we were hit multiple different times in small ways it was death by a thousand cuts almost <laughs> because it just it, every time we turned around it was like okay there's there's a covid problem you know because uh, it seemed like that was an excuse for a long time we have seen that the, the supply chain is now uh leveling out but it's the price of fuel that now really started to make uh, a pretty bad impact right wow that's a lot to go through all the while you're shifting kind of your business model <laughs> to, to, to go along with it. You know, it's, it'd be one thing to manage supply chain and logistics with a normal business year going to events or something and shifting that sounds like it would be <laughs> it, yeah, it a little was, stressful. Was challenging. One of the, uh, you know, I guess I'm telling a little trade secret here, but that's okay. Everybody can appreciate it. Um, one of the things that we have been successful with with our business, and I, and I do encourage businesses to do this, is to have the supply ready. So what I mean by that, and, and I'm going to step back to 2019 as an example. In 2019, when we were going to shows, you know, we were successful. We are still successful because of this model. That It's available in hand. Right. Now, there are certain things that you cannot buy ready-made. You have to have it made for you, custom-made. But there are a number of items that we can. And where we were lucky is we always kept a very high quantity of product on hand, which makes our accountant scream. But for <laughs> us, it's, uh, it's, it's, be, it's important because uh, it's kind of funny. When you go to kind of a little bit off track here, but when you see us set up an event, we, you'll probably likely see us say, truckload after truckload of uh, car hand carts in of these plastic totes, these red or red and black plastic yeah. rubber made totes. And what I always tell people is this is not the product we're actually selling that you see on a shelf. This is all of our back stock. Mm -hmm. So under every table is three to four totes of product. And that's our waistcoats, breeches, shirts, mugs, all of the extra things that we have, because if we don't have the size to fit that person, they're not going to buy it or they may buy it from somebody else. So as a business, if you capitalize that and say, we're going to have everything available as much as you can, of course, you can't have everything. Anything we can have higher stock that we're going to have. Right. Well, when we couldn't do shows, 
that allowed us to to manage and, and to navigate that supply chain issue because we saw an increase, a slightly increase in sales, and we instantly said, "Let's get another order in for X, X product." And it's okay if it takes us three or four months because we have, you know, four to six months worth of supply. You know, and of course, as you grow, as we found out, that four to six month supply turned into one to two months, and then you, yeah, you end up having to wait a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but having that stock on hand was was very helpful. So it was kind of the hoarding mentality uh, actually paid off in, right. in this case. So did your, and maybe if, if this is trying to get into it too much, let me know, but I'm, I'm curious because of the event cancellations, did what people were buying change over time? Because I know I shifted what I was doing. I was concerned about like my clothing, for example, going into that year and then with the event cancellations kind of shifted into some other items that I could make because I knew I would be home and have some time. Did you see a similar change with the items that you were ordering? We, we noticed an entire change. Okay. Um, it, was, it was funny. It came in, it came in waves like everything. Right. Uh, with COVID, everything came in waves. The first thing we noticed more than anything was the self-preparedness items. Okay. I sold out. I sold out of tomahawks in a matter of days. I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, just gone. It's COVID. Then, I gotta have um, a tomahawk. That's right. Uh, but then, but then the next, the next huge category for us uh, at the time was fire starting. Okay. Uh, weird, weird category, but flint steel strikers uh, and toe and, and little tins and, and all the leather pouches to go with them gone. Um, we saw more utilitarian items, um, cooking items. Cooking items were absolutely berserk for a short while because people were at home and they could cook. They could do this. They wanted to try new things. You know, all the restaurants, uh, all the, you know, a lot of restaurants were closed uh, it, or had such a long wait that it was <laughs> better just to stay at home and cook. And so we had people cooking in their backyard and, and uh, cooking in their – oh, we had one customer said that they – had never cooked in their uh, hearth oven or their hearth um, fireplace. And because of COVID, they did. And so they bought, you know, utensils and things for that. So that's that we always sold those items, but it, it wasn't in the volume and, and the time of year. Uh, we always know we're going to sell more fire starting and trinkety stuff like that in the fall because people are gearing up for Christmas and it's just, I don't know, you, you, it's fall, you have this kind of outdoorsy feel. There's nothing better than a crisp fall morning out in the woods. Right. So, you know, I, you have that kind of, well, we were selling that in May June. And in <laughs> March and April and May, it was just like, why? This doesn't make sense. So we had that. Um, and then what we had is some of our higher end lines of clothing and things like that, or our custom items. We had more people investing in that because they wanted to up their, uh, you know, persona. Right. And their coats, like, you know, really every gentleman walking around should be wearing some type of sleeved coat. Mm-hmm. It wasn't common for a gentleman to be walking around in just a shirt and a waistcoat. And so people started buying the coats. Like, well, might as well. You know, we have nothing else to do. And I think to a degree, the people that had a steady income and, and that weren't affected as much that were, um, uh, uh, not required workers, or what was the word everyone kept using now? Uh, uh, essential workers. Essential, yeah. Yeah. The, the new essential workers, I, we're very blessed to have them because I, they recognize that, hey, we need to support these small businesses. And um, we, we may be a little larger in the field of reenacting uh, in, in living history, but we are by no means a big business. I mean, we're a small business, family operated. You know, we, we've got less than 15 people that work here. We're a small business, uh, yeah. very small. And um, so, yeah. It, Products changed, what people purchased changed, um, and we, we saw all these uh, just different influxes, different certain categories throughout throughout the uh, throughout the time. Hmm. That's. I'm really glad that you said that because that lines up really well with the other businesses that I've talked to. Uh, I mean, even if you just look at like the camping and outdoor industry, it just exploded because people couldn't 
go to like public events or something. So they try to go camping and go out in the woods somewhere. It was something that you could do to get out. And, and I'm glad that you saw some benefit out of that. Hmm. Yeah. It, it, it also allowed us to expand some categories uh, okay. that we didn't know existed and, um, or, or product, I should say, that didn't exist that we could add to our uh, already successful categories uh, of business. So, yeah, it, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the, 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 the million people that have lost their lives to COVID and, you know, our family yeah. is not immune to that. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I am thankful for the, the progress we've made as a country in the world to, to live in a safer place than we were maybe two years ago. Uh, but I will say that with with every with every fire comes positivity, and we, when we had all this death and destruction, now we can look back and we we can see some really good positive things that did come out of it. Um, lots of growth. We can see this personally with our our business and uh, our customers. Lots of growth within the within the living history community. The amount of research that was done during those the last 24, 28 months really is, is impressive. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's that's a very good positive to come out of this. People researched their um, the, the history more. Uh, museums, this was a great thing uh, uh, that, that happened with during COVID. Because of COVID, museums placed, many, many museums placed you know, their collections in some, time, some cases, their entire collections online. online. Yeah. And wow, talk about a tremendous time to, to view collections. And then with technology today and the cameras that are available and the lenses to see up close. I mean, you, you almost truthfully can see the product better on a screen than you can in person because you're so close to it that you can see the individual grain lines of the wood. I mean, it's just, there, there is, that was, that was a great thing, a great byproduct of such a terrible disease. But um, it, it was it was nice to see some positivity throughout that. I really appreciate you sharing your perspective on this because I think I see a lot where people are speculating and and trying to understand it kind of from the outside looking in uh, because we're still seeing the effects of all of this. You know, there's still I mean, especially in muzzleloading, I think a lot of the foundries and, and places where things are cast still haven't gotten to like muzzleloading supplies. Um, and I hope that they are able to soon uh, to to keep that going. But I, I'm really glad to hear that you've had, um, like you said, some good success with it. You know, apart from obviously, you know, not trying to d- diminish, you know, like you said, the lives lost and the amount of man hours that went in to the last few years to get through this to where we are today. You know, I think we, we all have to. We could, it's easy to focus on the negative, but yeah. when you can sit back and, and, and really spend some time to look at the, at the positives, that's what we really need to focus on. So I, I'm, I'm thankful for all the lessons that we learned during that time uh, when it comes to and managing uh, growth and business and employees. Uh, it, it's, been, it's been an interesting time, but it's, it's been very rewarding to to be able to see the growth and to, to reap the benefits of all the hard work that uh, our staff and, and I did um, over the last couple of years. And so uh, and our staff really has done a, a tremendous job managing that and growing as we've grown um, and embracing. We have, a, we have a, real quickly, we have a, a weekly meeting every Monday where uh, we call it our you know, Monday morning meeting. <laughs> and it's such uh, so we have our triple M there, and, uh, and we always just kind of go over what the week is. Uh, it's, la- it's laughed at now because I'd say, well, I have nothing in particular this week. And we know by by uh, our meetings at 9 a.m., by 10 a.m., that's our challenge. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're doing something. And so uh, it's great. And uh, being able to, to grow different lines of our business, we're getting ready to, to, to launch a couple new uh, lines here. Um, that are going to be really exciting, especially for the early 19th century market. Ooh. So we're very excited about that and getting uh, that going. And we're hoping to have that um, by the start of quarter four okay. this year. So 
So if you're going to make Stonewall 1812, make sure you come and see us. Okay. (laughs) Awesome. Well, I guess with that, what other events are are you going to be at this year for people to check you out in person? I mean, obviously, everybody should be already on the website, but uh, what events can they come check you out at? Well, um, so we're like anything that's uh, that's changing by the moment. You hate to say it, but um, so we we actually just purchased uh, the building next to our building uh, to expand Ooh. into. So we're now occupying two buildings. Uh, with that uh, comes a lot of work and responsibility that we have to get done. So mm-hmm. we are, we were we are hoping to attend uh, Fort Niagara, which is uh, during the July Fourth weekend. We are so hoping to do that, but we're not 100% sure. I know our first absolute for certain show will be at uh, Fairley, Boston in Ohio, followed by Cantini up in Illinois, and that's in the second weekend of September. Uh, Colonial Market Days, which was actually supposed to be this upcoming weekend, has moved permanently to the third full weekend of September. And that's an event that uh, our company uh, helps organize and put on, and that's done here in our hometown. It's grown tremendously. So please uh, come and see us there. It's a Colonial Market Days here in Lebanon, Indiana. Uh, and then uh, we do the, what we call the Fall Run. You get the Feast of the Hunter's Boon, and uh, Miss Sonal 1812, Locust Grove, and then we're back down to uh, Camden the second week of November. Wonderful. That's quite a few events for people to come check you out in. Lots of places, and we're hoping to uh, get out to Brandywine. It's the oh. 245th anniversary of Battle of Brandywine, and that's outside of uh, Philadelphia, and that is the last weekend of September. Okay. So. so you'll be doing Colonial Market Days, which is an event that you help host, and then you're packing up and going out east. That's right. Wow. And then we got to come straight back. So, yeah, we were looking at the schedule those the other day. It's kind of funny. So we're going to do tear down Colonial Market Days on Monday. Uh, we're going to breathe on Tuesday. Wednesday, we're going to travel out to Pennsylvania, set up on Thursday, do the show Friday, Saturday, Sunday, drive home on Monday, um, be back in the shop on Tuesday, set up at the feast on Wednesday, and then we have feast Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, <laughs> Tear down from the feast and set up directly at Mrs. Cinewall the next day. Wow. So, yeah. Um, You're booking it. Lots, lots of seat time. <laughs> <laughs> lots of road time. That's awesome, man. Where can people find you uh, on social media? I'll have links to everything in the show notes, too, here. But I just want to make sure that we get everything from you. Well, my marketing uh, directors would be uh, pretty upset if I don't mention them all. So I'm going to try. Okay. Uh, well, I know we're on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Pinterest. Uh, okay. there's, uh, we have a new channel now uh, on TikTok. So any of our uh, younger generations that enjoy well, all generations, I should say, the, the, the TikTok app, uh, we're on that. And then we're also uh, on on YouTube. That is a very small channel. We're not there. Uh, but that's a very exciting announcement that we have coming up, I believe, in August. So stay stay tuned for our YouTube channel. There's a lot of changes. Awesome. Uh, great growth happening there. Um, whole new studio coming. So we'll get excited for that. Um, and I think that may be it, but I'm sure I'm missing someone. So Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, TikTok, those are the neighbors. Excellent. That's a lot of places for people to come see you, come check you out. And I'm, I'm really happy to hear you guys expanding more of the online stuff. I mean, events are always going to be important. They're always going to be crucial. But I think uh, seeing Samson Historical really take the internet by storm is really going to kind of blaze a trail for a lot of people, I think, here. You know, and I I'll, I just want to offer this too. Anybody that's out there listening that's um, curious on, on what to do or, or some advice I am always willing to to talk with other business owners. I've never been the type of uh, business owner that's kind of held all of our secrets. I think it takes all of us to make the world go round. And, um, you know, we're going to have, we, we have experienced a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. And my experience may not be the best way for you, but if you can learn from our mistakes or our successes, uh, that's the best way to do it. So anybody that ever wants to get in contact with me, just shoot us an email and 
uh, we'll be I'll be happy to do whatever I can to help out. Well, let's hit that if you have a little bit more time, real quick. Oh sure. What are like your top five? tips you'd recommend to somebody that's interested in history, interested in getting involved, has some entrepreneurial spirit and wants to get going or somebody, you know, you, you can pick, you know, somebody just getting started or somebody out there that's listening to this, hoping to glean some insight on how to do, have a similar turnaround that you have had coming through COVID. You know, what are some things that you'd recommend to either of those? Well, I think for, for either, they're going to be pretty similar. Um, maybe some differences, but the, one of the first things I can say is, is to truly advertise. Um, business cards are the cheapest form of advertisement. Cheapest. Hand them out. Throw them out like Tic Tac. Every time you're at an event, have them out there. Um, but it, we don't stop there. You have to be unique. It's a, it's a flyer, a brochure. Uh, people love tangible items. I know we're in a digital market, and a huge part of our marketing budget is through digital. Mm -hmm. But print media is still... It, it is critical. Um, if you really, really want to get out there, uh, there are ways that you can start creating a mailing list. Uh, it doesn't cost that much to have a postcard sent to somebody. So, you know, if you've got 100 people on your mailing list at only 50 cents a piece, it's really not that expensive to, to mail them out a postcard just to say, hey, we're here. Thank you. You know, things like that to, to really touch to be involved with your customers. So advertising is probably uh, the, the first one. Uh, and two would be communication. Um, always respond to your customers. I, I'm going to be honest, you're never going to make every customer happy. It's not going to happen. But you have to try. And you have to work. And you have to make sure uh, that you're doing everything you can to make them happy. Uh, and... and we obviously want all of our customers to be happy, but you have to accept that sometimes it's just not going to happen. Uh, the third is to, to be available, which is aside from communication, but be available on all medias that you can. So have a, have a website, have a Facebook, uh, be be available on different channels, go to events. Um, we love going to the events. It's unfortunate uh, that sometimes our schedule with this with the expansion of the building is limited us this year, but uh, there's no better way to be in front of your customers than to be truly in front of your customers uh, at events or at, at, at shows. Uh, you know, that, that's that's probably the third one. Uh, fourth, I would say, would be reliability. Customers are okay if you tell them it's going to be two weeks or something uh, up front. And if they don't want to wait two weeks, then they'll tell you. And they may not be the customer for you. But don't don't overpromise. Wow. I, I better, I'd rather... Uh, uh, deliver early than deliver late. And uh, so always to be reliable on, on your time. And, and lastly, I would say to utilize technology as much as you can. There's a lot of information out there on different sites, different websites, different channels. Um, when it comes to e-commerce, there's no, I don't think there's really one better than the other channel that's exactly perfect for one customer right. or one business, but to do your research and to stick with it. The more you jump around, it becomes harder to deal with. So the technology is, is critical. Even though we all love the 18th century and 19th century <laughs> and in early Americas, uh, we all live in this 21st century. And it's um, it, you can be very successful using those tools that are right at our disposal. I think those are some great tips. And I think the kind of things that people might not think about when they're, you know, kind of going through this and trying to think about their businesses or, or thinking about, you know, the business side of muzzleloading and living history. So I, I really appreciate you sharing those. That's, those are some good tips. Well, you know, if we're, if we're not learning, our eyes are closed and our ears are shut because we should be learning every day and we should be realizing because there's always, I tell my staff every day, there's a hundred different ways to chop down an apple tree. You find the one way that works for you. And and that's what we need to do um, collectively, individually, as business owners, entrepreneurs, is always learn, be willing to learn, and always understand that there is more than one way to do something. Mm -hmm. So, 
That's awesome. Pretty, sounds pretty basic, but it truly is, has helped me a ton. Yeah, and it's it's those fundamentals that people gloss over because a lot of times they're just kind of they're just work. You know, they're not flashy, they're not fancy, but there's stuff that needs to get done. And if you're not focusing on those, you're just blown right by them, and you're not building a good foundation for anything. Then, absolutely. I'd like to thank Casey again for taking time out of his busy schedule there to sit down and chat with me. It's always nice to hear from the businesses that support the muzzleloading and living history communities and, and get their perspectives. Like I've said, if you haven't already, please check out the Samson historical website and social media pages. They've really upped their game. It's really exciting to see. It's really fun to watch the content that they're producing. I think a lot of times we can consider history to be a little boring or stuffy, but the Samsons are right out there out front, making it look as fun as it is to bring in new people, which is something I can always get behind. We'll have links to their website and social media pages in the show notes and the description, as well as at ilovemuzzloading.com with the blog post that goes along with this episode. If you're not already aware, that blog post associated with the episode is going to feature a bunch of pictures and other information about the Samsons and their business and, uh, and some of the nice items uh, that they've been producing. I mentioned earlier that the, uh, the art direction for the catalog changes each year. I really encourage you to check out the 2022 catalog. They've taken a lot of inspiration from paintings of the 18th centuries with their photographs featuring uh, especially their clothing, but as well as their home goods and other items. It's really neat to see the, uh, the passion that they have for history and the material culture of the day uh, kind of leak into and, and spread through all aspects of the business. If you're listening to this as it comes out, we're probably about halfway through the muzzleloading competition event season for the year, and we're heading towards the late summer and the fall season. I encourage you to get out there with some of your equipment, some of your clothing, and some of your gear and have some fun. Even if you're just going out to the local range, your club, or going camping in the woods with some friends, please get out there and use this stuff. It's, uh, there's nothing wrong really with hanging it up on a wall. You know, it's all really beautiful, but I think uh, we can really connect with history and with muzzleloading when you're out there using the equipment that generations before did. That's all I have for you today. 